Growing up in Venezuela, I was never attracted to the idea of being part of the army. I was relieved to know that as a young gay man, the military would never accept me. So when I moved to Canada, I couldn't understand why gays and lesbians were fighting for the right to join the army. At that time, I started to wonder how homosexuals would fit in the armed forces. Years later, I read an article about Paul Jackson's thesis on gay men in the Canadian military during World War II. I contacted Paul and asked him if he'd be interested in collaborating on a film to bring his work to a wider audience. He agreed and introduced me to some of the men whose personal stories put a human face on his research. Paul Jackson became my guide into a hidden chapter of Canada's past. I was always aware that this could destroy my service career if it became known. And I always did my very best to make sure that none of this information ever got out. I would have been ashamed for any of my friends to have found out that I was gay. In the evenings, you would see all sorts of cruising going on from high-ranked officers to low enlisted men. Everything was okay until if you were caught doing something you shouldn't have been doing or should have been doing or whatever, where you want to look at it. This was an ordinary shop, I guess, and uh, the man said, no, oh, what's the problem? Was yours for men? I said, no, well, yes. I have a piece of music, a Bach, which he used to play, and I've got the music, and I've got his name across the top, and I get it out and play it, and I have had fond memories for 50 years or more about him. I wouldn't have known then, but I'm sure it was a love affair. Coats. We were very, very formal. There was no such thing as teenagers in those days. You were a boy and then you were a man. Nobody talked about it in the, before the war and even, even just after the war. Even during the war, I did not know that you could fall in love with another man. There was such a thing as homosexuals. Notice the, the Tony Curtis haircut, which everybody... I think I even grew up with the idea that someday I would get married. I was still thinking that what I, what I was doing was a, just a naughty sexual habit. It had nothing to do with homosexuality as a, as a, as a subject of, uh, you know, emotions and intellect and everything else. I think, uh, oh, it, it was a long time afterwards that I realised that homosexuality was a, a, a nice thing you could do with another person of the same sex. What words were they used for gay back then? The word gay wasn't used, period, and uh, queer. Queer? I don't know, queer, I don't, I don't remember.
during the 1930s, you never saw anything in print or on the, heard anything on the radio or anywhere about the subject. It was just never mentioned, as it was even more unmentionable than cancer. His Majesty has just proclaimed that a state of war with the German Reich exists as of tonight, September 10th, 1939. At the time, people assumed that every decent person was straight. One never expected to actually meet a homosexual, and the very word suggested deviance and degeneracy. A Sebastian of moral uprightness, the Canadian military could never admit the presence of such perverts in its ranks. And in Lisbon, nobody never asked questions about that. They checked you to see if you were breathing well, and that was... As long as you could walk and hold a rifle, yeah. you were in. Yeah. You didn't have to walk, you could just lay there and hold a rifle. <laughs> yeah. Or throw grenades. When I joined up in Toronto, I was over 21. I had an interest in my country. My father was killed in the military. Uh, in a sense, we had a, a tradition of service. And what else would I do? Why, why wouldn't I join the army when everybody else was joining the army and when it was the, the change in your life? I joined the Armored Corps and went to Camp Borden and learned how to drive trucks and tanks and other things. I had lived with my sister and mother, mother all my life, and now I'm in a completely male environment. I don't know I'm gay yet. Uh, and I certainly didn't have any gay experiences before I went to the UK. I don't ever really think I was a military type, but uh, I just found that military life suited me. And I suppose it, was, it could well have been partly because there were so many men there, and I had a sexual interest in males. Just after Dunkirk was when I decided to enlist, and I was sort of torn between pacifist inclinations and uh, wanting to do something about the war. So I decided to apply for the medical corps. I joined the army when I was 19. I grew up in Waterloo, Ontario. And uh, for two years, I'd been going out with a girl about once a week, sort of a understood steady arrangement just uh, going along with social pressures. I had to have a girlfriend like everybody else. In the summer of 41, we went to Camp Borden. We were under tents in a small desert. It was all sand. Here they come, a group of new recruits among many thousands all across the country, entering the world of army life for the first time. Not bad. Behind them, the barrier swings down on the old civilian life. Ahead lies another world, new, strange, unknown. I was completely repressed while I was in the army. I didn't even begin to suspect that I might possibly be gay until I was out of the army. I found myself in a very congenial situation. I no longer had any worries about maintaining a social life involving women. I'm just going to read to you something that we were arguing about yesterday. Now listen to this. Good rule depends on the first... In retrospect, I can see that people were making advances to me, which I didn't recognize at the time and didn't respond to. For God's sake, shut up. There's another thing that's wrong. Would you forget about your pamphlets? Why don't you get a little bit of music into your soul? Sure, Ollie. Don't you remember the South Downs? Yeah, and how, Tiger? and how it rained. Sure. Up to your eyes in water, up to your knees in slush, using the kind of language that makes your sergeant blush. Who wouldn't be a soldier? Sure, I would like to know. They sent a man on furlough. And he simply refused to go. That was the School of Architecture, McGill University. While we were in our last year in 4041, we had military service on the campus every week. We marched up and down and wore prickly uniforms. 
And uh, I think that was a bit of a brainwashing because uh, by the time we, we graduated, we were all ready to volunteer for, to die for king and country, the British Empire, waving the flag and all that, which we, most of us did. All this business of off officers of these ranks, this military business, you felt it was, a, it was very rigid, that you just had to do it. And I always felt very odd about it because I didn't like it. But I did it, and I saluted very smartly, not this, this one. The leaders of our men come from the ranks pre-selected for their qualities. They are trained, molded, strengthened for their tremendous and unique task. Young, eager, proud, these soldier Canadians are the best we, uh, the country has produced. We did our initial work at Clinton, Ontario, where they had a big um, a radar uh, course instructed by officers from England. And uh, I made a, I met friends who were friends. I met a couple uh, who were of romantic interest. Well, we bunked up in a common area, but as his bunk happened to be next to mine, we just held hands across. That was George. And my is very handsome. We became very, very good friends and spent our leaves together. Yeah, I would say it was liberating uh, in that it took me out of my little house down in the east end of Toronto. It moved me into areas with people of all kinds of nationalities and temperaments and knowledge and professional skills, and I saw the world. I came to England with convoys, but I wasn't in a military unit. I was just being hosted. The trip was quite fascinating. It took 10 days, and we zigzagged all, all over the Atlantic Ocean. They received us with fanfares and open arms, you see. And then we were put, put on a train we came through London, it was pitch dark. And of course, immediately after, the sirens went for an air raid. So I thought we'd all get up and run. Nobody moved. <laughs> See, they, all just, they were used to these air raids, but I wasn't. So anyway, I just sat there shaking, I think. Eventually ended up with a platoon of 60 men. You've heard of the Bailey Bridge. We were the first to build the first Bailey Bridge. It was very exciting because uh, we used it in, a lot in Germany. We built a 300-foot Bailey Bridge underwater in the Rhine while they built things on the bank. And in the morning, we hoisted it up and tanks went across the Rhine. We, we built it in the dark overnight, My me and my platoon of 60 men. There are thousands of us, each doing a special job in a special way. Each one plays an important part in that highly complex operation called war. First, we went up to Dundurn as to be stationed, and that's where I met uh, a man named Howard Large, who had been a, a member of the famous Dumbbells in, in the First World War. And uh, he, he wanted to uh, organize a concert party, and uh, I had always done a great deal of singing, 
I was a cute little guy, I guess, and he decided that I would made to order for a female impersonation. I didn't mind trying, so I sang in falsetto in the tin hats. He got the IODE in Moose Jaw to uh, donate a dress. And this was a sort of a ball gown. When I went into the war, I had no idea that I was going to end up entertaining soldiers. But uh, that's the way it worked out. What qualities must a man develop that would enable him to lead men into the face of machine gun fire? Or the officers, bomb during a bombing attack. there was one especially, I remember, who had promised his wife in Canada that he wouldn't touch another woman while he was away. But as, as they never mentioned men, he thought it was all right to try me. And he'd get out his little willy and say, play with me, play with me. I said, no. And he tried it many times, and it was a horrible little willy. Anyway, even if, even if, even if I felt like it, uh, you know, I did, the whole thing was just quite horrible. <laughs> and it went on for quite some time. He wasn't a bad chap. He was uh, very ambitious. He used to get promotions every so often. He became a colonel of some kind uh, towards the end. Would this man be considered homosexual? The military offered an erotically charged environment for men just discovering their attraction to other men. There were no policies established to deal with homosexuality during the early years of the war. Some servicemen were actively homosexual and discreet behavior was tolerated. But men who didn't conform to conventional notions of masculinity could be shunned or mistreated by their peers. And so we arrived at Aldershot, after a journey that had brought some of the boys 6,000 miles from home. I had my first sexual experience in the cinema in Aldershot. The place was full of uh, soldiers of all kinds. You sat in the crowd, and uh, the one nice young man next to me started groping, you see. And instead of uh, hitting him and saying, hey, watch out, you, I rather liked it, you see, so I encouraged him. And, uh, well, I don't suppose we watched the film very, but we didn't have zips in those days. It was buttons, wasn't it? The zip wasn't invented yet. So there wasn't a lot of unzipping, but a lot of unbuttoning. <laughs> and uh, it was going on all over. The whole, everybody was doing it, you see. Les distractions ne leur manquent point. Les hommes jouissent d'un changement complet d'atmosphère, chose si nécessaire dans la guerre moderne. I had been sent on course with one of our sergeants. And when it came to New Year's Eve, they had a dance. So Harry and I went to the dance. And then we went out drinking in the local pub for an hour or two. We came back, and before we went to bed, we went to the John to urinate. And it didn't take too long to see that we both had hard on. And one thing led to another. And then on, when we, he said to me, why don't you, he said, all the people in my room are Brits, so they've been allowed to stay home. Why don't you come and sleep with me? So I said, fine, which I did. And then he really became my mentor. He told me how people who were gay dressed, how they talked, what they thought about, what they did, how they made love, uh, the whole bit, and I had never experienced any of this before. And uh, it was a whole new, uh, I hadn't realized that there were gay pubs in London, which he took me to. There were that many people away from home and away from wives and girlfriends and who were prepared to have sex with anybody as long as it was sex. All ages, men, men in their civilians in their 60s and 70s in business suits, 
on Americans in uniform, Brits, Canadians, although I, as I say, I stayed away from Canadians, generally speaking. I couldn't quite believe it, really. As you say, I was like a kid in a candy store. I never, I never thought anything like this was possible. There was a famous bar in Naples called Mama's. In the evenings, you would see all sorts of cruising going on from high-ranked high officers to low enlisted men. They had a big counter, and uh, some of the uh, more adventurous ones would get out on the counters and do their numbers and, uh, you know, d uh, dances and so on. And uh, it was just uh, a wonderful bar. They don't have them like that anymore. There was one body house which uh, catered strictly for males, which had a waiting room with uh, peepholes. <laughs> Which you, which one, which one could rent, and eventually you must have been on scene yourself when you finally got the room. When we were um, in Chittingfold, there was one from the local village called Rita, and she used to, she, they used to line up, uh, and she used to lie in the back of a lorry with a Coca-Cola and a, and a hamburger, and she used to get fucked one after the other by these horny Canadian uh, heterosexuals. I think she did about a, two dozen in the evening. Every night she was there, the, the local prostitute. I don't know whether they paid her or whether she was doing it as a patriotic duty. There was this strange attitude, this feeling that as you're in the army and going to go overseas, that you might get killed. Well, enjoy yourself now. As the war progressed, the military became disturbed by increasing reports of queer activity. Unwilling to lose trained personnel, the institution used disciplinary measures to punish and deter queer behavior in its ranks. But how could the military suppress homosexuality without implying it was widespread? The court-martial was the military's strongest deterrent. Each week, a list of courts martial was posted for all to see. All crimes were fully detailed, except homosexual offenses, which were simply described as disgraceful conduct of an indecent kind. As a result, many servicemen went through the entire war without realizing their erotic pleasures with other men were actually considered criminal. Hurry, 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 folks. It's showtime in the old Garrison Theater tonight. The house is jammed. Hello, everybody. This is one of the five units of the First Canadian Army show overseas. For the next 90 minutes, we want you to lean back and relax and laugh with us. And now we have Unit E. For Canada, we march along as we sing a song, the song of freedom. Everyone's a real front fighter, and all the world's a real front fighter. We were touring all the time, doing shows, 
to the troops. We did uh, a number of sequences. One was Yankee Doodle Dandy from the movie. We also did a gay 90s number. There was one other female impersonator, John Hewood, who did some marvelous things after the war. When it comes to glamour, what is it that Betty Grable has that Five Div hasn't got? He was primarily a dancer, but he sang. He was quite an extrovert. We did some skits, comedy skits. This was the poppy bit, as we called it. Whitey would come out on stage. I still don't get it. Wally, yeah. I'll explain it so that even you will understand it. Thanks very much. Now you take this flower. A poppy, which would make him irresistible, just wave it under the girl's nose and, and she couldn't resist. You mean to say one waft and you got her? That's the idea. W will it work for me? Why, certainly it will. On came Johnny, a lady. Hey, Slash, just a moment, please. Uh, wafty, wafty. Hmm. Yippee! <laughs> I can remember I was uh, in my dressing room I was, and somebody came by and looked in the window and said hi and I said hi he said thanks thanks for what uh, you're the first first English girl who's spoken to me we used to take off our weeks at the end of the show when they were they were a little startled I think because we looked quite feminine Entertainment boosted morale. I think the troops had a pretty grim life, very short on comforts, was extremely important. I did one thing rather well. That was a female impersonation. Even as the military criminalized homosexuality, its entertainment often included drag sketches. Was turning it into a joke, a way of diffusing anxiety about the presence of real queers in the military? Men who realized they were queer kept it a secret. Being one of the boys was a way of belonging, and belonging was a way of staying safe. I didn't look sweet and nice and tidy and neat, and I looked butch. Every other word when it had to be was fuck. And I made a habit of this just to make sure that people wouldn't say, hey, why doesn't he talk like us? And I sort of adopted the mannerisms of uh, basic people in my unit so that no one would have ever had any suspicion, suspicion that I was anything but straight. What about this one? I don't know when that was taken. Well, it was before you were a female impersonator. That's for sure. you have a moustache. Yes, of course, yes. being a female impersonator, it stands to reason that some people might mm. think of me as being a feminine and, Carlton, I believe. and, uh, and Carlton, approach me in that fashion. It didn't bother me particularly, uh, although it was rather annoying that if people didn't take my word for it, that I was not homosexually inclined. And this one? Oh, that was taken in Holland. Johnny told me that on occasion he'd warn people off me, telling them that I was straight. Mm -hmm. I guess not queer is more like it. And this, oh, this is a gorgeous uh, one. I signed it off to Johnny. Uh, That's he Johnny Hewood? Yes, he mm -hmm. didn't keep it. No. Evidently. Look at those eyelashes. Were they false? Well, of course. <laughs> and this one? That was taken in Regina, I believe. Mm -hmm. 
in the hometown. Yeah. There were a number of relationships in the tin hats, which uh, we didn't show the light of day, but uh, I think that uh, everybody just minded their own business. And uh, if there was a, a liaison, so what? Had no, uh, if it had nothing to do with me, for example, I, I just let it go. For men who had developed deep friendships and depended on each other for their lives, a comrade's reliability and trustworthiness were far more important than his sexual preference. When a queer serviceman was reported to the authorities, it was nearly always by the military police or someone outside his unit. There was suddenly a rumor that somebody was going to be transferred from uh, the, uh, one of the regiments, fighting regiments, uh, to our outfit because they didn't want to prosecute him and, they, so that they, and our colonel, who was a very tolerant person, had uh, agreed to take him into our unit. He was a real queen. He was so flamboyant. When he arrived at the outfit, he had more gimmicks on his uniform than you could believe. And he was telling me, telling me uh, not long after that he'd been in to see the colonel, and the colonel had said, you take all those things off, and I don't care what you do, but don't attract attention. <laughs> Everybody in the outfit knew he was gay, but it never bothered anybody. Everybody liked him. He was quite popular. I don't know whether our outfit, a medical outfit, was more tolerant than most, but probably not. By the middle of the war, military police were rigorous in investigating homosexual activity. Medical services had defined homosexuality as a pathological illness. They claimed homosexuals were a bad influence and had to be discharged. Were you aware that people could be uh, court-martialed for that kind of thing? Oh, yes. I sat on uh, three or four court-martials uh, as a member of the court-martial, and uh, young men were repeatedly being charged, committing homosexual acts and so on. Well, there would be three other officers, or two other officers, who the, the more senior one would uh, preside and the uh, accused would be let in and charges read against him. The court-martial hearing was intended to humiliate the accused. Explicit details of his very private sexual acts were read aloud and used as evidence against him. We didn't retire, we looked at each other, yes, oh, yes. And they would come to a quick decision that he should no longer be in the service and sent home. Everyone present felt the full weight and shame of the charge. Presiding officers were morally obliged to uphold the laws. How did I vote for discharge? The court-martial was designed to intimidate homosexuals into changing their behavior. That way, the forces could keep needed men without compromising their wholesome image. Yes, I might have been in that position, but never was. Why? How come? What saved you? Discretion. Did you feel 
feel there was anything you could do to help them out? If I did, I would be hurting myself. How? My own reputation would be uh, more or less destroyed if I were, were the only ones voting not guilty. But there was a chance you could have said not guilty? I, there was a chance I could have, but I didn't. How could you have argued it if you wanted to? Could you say that this wasn't disgraceful conduct? No. Well, do you remember the charges? It was disgraceful conduct, and that's it. It was a disgraceful conduct according to the military code, the rules of conduct. And you also realized that your conduct was disgraceful outside of the court? Well, I didn't think about the court when I was mis if I were misconducting myself. A court martial could officially label a man homosexual. Being identified as homosexual meant imprisonment, dishonorable discharge, or both, as well as public disgrace. For officers, the harshest sentence included the permanent loss of privileges and opportunities in the civilian world. Military psychiatrists knew that men convicted of homosexuality were likely to attempt suicide, but still accepted the court-martial as the most effective deterrent. There's a lot more here. What are these? Nancy, Luneville. Uh, did I tell you what I, what my job was? Uh, with General Patton in Dachau, which is the concentration camp where we stayed quite a few days. We were stationed at our Augsburg in the spring of 45, just before the end of the war. We were sent to, to de-booby trap the bodies, which the Germans did. They used to, so that if you moved them, you'd get blown up, you see. That was our job. And we, it, it really awful. I, I was speechless for weeks. You can't believe that, but I, I didn't say a word. For, and the other Canadians and Americans, they were really ill. They all were. There was a must, we spent about two or three weeks in this place. And the, I was telling Paul, the most touching thing was that the, the other inhabitants who were still alive volunteered to move these bodies in case they blew up so that they said we're practically dead we're dying and that 500 a day were dying they were just starving and skeletons it was really terrible and they said you don't want to kill yourself we will move these bodies for you and that was really ter terrible <laughs> never forget that these poor skeletons who were di dying and they moved these bodies so that we shouldn't die. You know? It was very terrible. It's never, never the same since have you gone through an experience like that. And there's people now who deny that this happened. You know, I get very angry because I was there, you see. Yeah. So, sorry about that. Yeah. That was the end afterwards. Dakar was as far as we got. It's impossible to know just how many homosexuals served in World War II. What we do know from the military records is that those who were prosecuted for homosexuality were diligent and popular soldiers and officers whose performance and leadership were not diminished by their sexual orientation.
is over. Towards the end of the war, the military implemented a policy that allowed the discharge of personnel suspected of homosexual tendencies. This laid the foundation for further anti-homosexual measures after the war. There was no military discipline at all. After the bomb dropped, they just said, just hang around, you see. I hadn't seen Montreal for several years, having been overseas, so I wandered the streets to familiarize myself with the place again. And the Montreal Hotel was, was the name I think I knew was a cruising place for gays. And uh, although I was still a, an amateur on, in the subject, I went. There were lots of people, lots of uniforms as well, but there was this Air Force man that I started chatting with. We sat, sat down on a settee. The security people in the hotel, uh, they didn't say much. They just said, come on, you dirty buggers, or what kind of language they use, and, and took, us, took us away and arrested us and said, what are you two doing? I was sent off to a military headquarters in Dominion Square. They suspected that I was a homosexual. They sent me to a psychiatrist who was useless. There was nobody to talk to. You, you didn't, they didn't have counselors then like they have now. And I had never talked about homosexuality to anybody, friends or family. But he sent in a report that I w was a suspected homosexual. He didn't even say I was. He was suspected and I was discharged on suspicion of being a homosexual, medically unfit for active service. I'll never forget that phrase. And that was in August 1945. Betrayal. I don't know if I use that word. I might now, but, but I don't think... Uh, I, don't, I don't think I thought. I was just numb. I became numb. I have been thrown out of the army after four years of doing all this, this stuff. And the, the shock, I said, how dare they? You know that. On the 2nd of June, 1962, I went down to Washington, and I'd been posted to the Pentagon on promoted lieutenant colonel. The night before I came back to Ottawa, I made the mistake of, I went into a John in downtown Washington, and there was some guy against the back wall hovering around, and I presumed that he was, he was gay. And one thing led to another, and I indicated where my interests lay, and then he said, I'm police, come upstairs. And he took me upstairs, got my identification, walked around the co corner, said, how much money have you got? And I had about $50 in my wallet, and I told him, he said, that's not enough. Get in the paddy wagon. And then eventually, on the morning that I was to start driving to Washington and taking up my new posting, I went to the office, to my office, I got a call, I was told that the director wanted to see me. I walked down and he was there with three or four brigadier generals and he looked at me and he said, you're not going to Washington, you're not going to be promoted lieutenant colonel, you're not doing a goddamn thing, the RCMP tell, tell us you're queer and homosexual and you'll be out of the army tomorrow. Go back to your apartment. And you can imagine what this did to me. I, I, I was, I was de desiccated. The military had been my life. And also, how was I going to explain it to my sister and brother, all my close personal friends? Nobody knew anything about my sexual life. And uh, what am I going to tell them why I've left the army? I poured myself a scotch. I put it on the television in front of the window. I went into the bedroom and got my Luger. I put two nine mil... mil millimeter bullets in it. I came out, I tried it on the side of my head, I had two or three drinks, and then I thought, fuck them, they're not going to kill me, and I went and put the gun back in the drawer and just went on with things. But I, I very seriously considered uh, blowing my brains out.
very close relationship. And I, we were only little boys of 26, you know. We separated in London, he was in the Air Force. He lived in Toronto. So before he came to Montreal to um, study at McGill, we were, were se separate. They had offered me the job uh, at McGill. So when I got there, I said, where is, what's his name? They told me that he was, uh, he was uh, terrified of, uh, of, of the attacks of being a homosexual. So he, he um, drove a motorbike, which was nice, and he d drove it into a, a garage and turned on the exhaust and killed himself that way. I uh, exhaust fumes, you know, they do in, from cars or, yeah. And I was, I was shattered when I discovered that he died, you see. That started my decline in Montreal and Canada. If people are going to commit suicide because they can't stand it here anymore, I better get away from here, you know. And I, I'm sure that he had lived, I, I would have, my life would have been influenced by his, I'm sure. The director of the school at McGill said, you're in a terrible state, you want to get away, you go to London for a year and come back, we'll keep your job for you. And he got me the job in London. And I came to London and I've been here ever since. Three mistakes, very bad. You mustn't make any mistakes. That's wonderful, you can hear yourself and criticize yourself. But is it your pride or something that you are ashamed that something like that should have happened to you? Or you just sense the injustice of it all? Why should that happen to me? And I think of it every day. Paul Jackson helped me see how military historians have shaped the image of the ideal soldier. In their account of Canada's role in World War II, they consciously omitted any reference of homosexuals who fought for freedom and democracy. Let us bow our heads and hearts in prayer. Dear God, we a free and grateful people gather to remember the selfless sacrifice of those who gave their lives to protect their nation and preserve our freedom. In 1992, Michelle Douglas, a former second lieutenant with a Special Investigations Unit, sued the Canadian military for discrimination based on sexual orientation. She succeeded, and from that moment on, the institution was forced to establish a complete open-door policy. But have things really changed? At a recent ceremony in Ottawa, Canada's Governor-General spoke about our past, about the meaning of Remembrance Day and those who participated in wars of the last century. She wondered aloud about who the unknown soldier may have been. She mentioned race, profession and all kinds of personal traits. But what she did not say was, and he may have been gay. This was a, a Friday in 19, June the 1st, 1973. And it was the Gollywog Lounge at that time. And the bar was gay and the tables around were not. That's the way it, it worked in there. And I came into the bar and sat down around the corner so I could see along the bar in order to be here. And there, there was Bert sitting halfway down with a drink. And I took one look at him and I said, I said that's mine. <laughs> and uh, it, it uh, really was. And, uh, and our uh, eyes, eyes met and we made the connection and paid up my drink. 
saw that Bert was about to finish his, went to the washroom and waited for Bert to arrive, and I thought he never would arrive. Meanwhile, somebody else was, was pushing at me and uh, trying to persuade me to go home with me, with him, and I was afraid Bert had come in and see us together and disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually Bert arrived, and uh, it was... A, One thing led to another, and I said, I've got a car around the corner, yeah. can I drive you home? And he said, yes. Yeah. So we drove up there, and he said, would you come in for a drink? Yeah. So I come in for a drink, we exchanged telephone numbers, among other things. 